Welcome to GSBA Rapid Response, uh, giving you the opportunity to ask questions with live answers. Today's immediate feedback comes directly from the SBA, answering questions about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and Paycheck Protection Program. My name is Joey Chapman. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am the Membership Development Manager for GSBA, and I will be today's Rapid Response Moderator. Along with fellow GSBA staff tuning in, uh, joining me today is Terea Miller, uh, Terea uses she, her, hers pronouns and is the GSBA Membership Programs Manager. GSBA continues to follow Governor Inslee's Stay Home, Stay Healthy order, uh, currently extended until May 4th. Our staff members continue practicing physical distancing, working remotely while staying socially connected with our up-to-date GSBA COVID-19 emergency response page and GSBA rapid response. So how will rapid response work for you? Uh, our format uh, for these virtual meetings is structurally organic, um, allowing you to engage professionals with questions in the wake of COVID-19. Today, we are streaming on both Zoom and Facebook Live. So throughout the hour, definitely feel free to ask questions uh, of our guests via the Q&A features. Both Terea and I will follow along, doing our very best to ensure your questions get answers. Please note also your, uh, for all viewers, your mics have been muted and uh, cameras have been disabled. Uh, today, we would like to go ahead and welcome our very special guests, uh, Mark Costello, SBA Deputy District Director, and Linda Laws, uh, Supervisory Lender Relations Specialist at the Seattle SBA District Office. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank Thanks, you. Joey. Mark and Linda, we'd like to go ahead and, and just give you a few moments uh, to each to give a little bit of a background about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Joey. Um, so I'm Mark Costello. Um, I'm the deputy uh, district director in the SBA uh, Seattle district office. Um, and generally what uh, SBA is involved with is, is uh, supporting small businesses. Um, and in normal times, we were typically doing that in kind of three primary area areas. Um, one being uh, financing, um, typically through our SBA guaranteed loan programs. Uh, another being technical assistance, uh, counseling and training for small businesses that is, is generally made available through uh, our uh, funded resource partners um, SCORE, Small Business Development Centers, Women's Business Centers, and um, Veteran Business Outreach Centers. And finally, we do also have a role in uh, government contracting, uh, primarily ensuring that, that an appropriate uh, amount of, of federal dollars are spent uh, uh, on Oh, looks like uh, we might have had a camera freeze. Uh, Linda, let's go ahead and just jump in and hear a little bit of back, your background and, and hopefully we can uh, go ahead and get Mark back online. Okay, so hi, I'm Linda Laws and I'm from the SBA and I'm the Supervisory Lender Relations Specialist. And as Mark was talking, we uh, support small businesses in a various ways and I'm involved on the lending side and I also uh, get involved with our economic development specialists um, as far as overseeing um, their outreach. And I'm quite sure that one of our uh, economic development specialists actually partners with you quite a bit, Desiree Albrecht and Lisa White. So um, typically uh, we, in, in my role, and we also have another lender relations specialist, we uh, do outreach to lenders, and we work with our resource partners to get the word out about our uh, regular loan programs that we facilitate. But today, we get to talk about uh, our disaster loan programs that we're currently facilitating for small businesses. Sure. So, um, well, let's hope that Mark comes back. Um, I know that he he forewarned us uh, before 
the hour uh, hit the top that um, he had having some issues with um, his internet connection. Um, so hopefully he'll be able to return and we won't have to dump all the questions and answers on to you, Linda. Um, right. So let's go, we'll do our best we can uh, to, to, to move forward. Um, and I'm sure uh, Carlos is behind the scenes trying to, to welcome him back. Um, so let's, let's just jump into some immediate rapid response uh, Q&A that we have on hand, um, particularly, you know, where we are uh, in, in the status of, of, of these funds. Um, so, you know, due to the lapse uh, in appropriations, the SBA is, is currently unable to accept uh, new applications uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program um, and Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Um, there is the belief, however, that uh, a new relief package uh, will be passed today in the Senate um, as soon as this afternoon and hopefully move on uh, to be fully passed uh, once again to help to support small businesses. So um, it's Chris of all time. What, uh, with your expertise, uh, what is your insight you know, for the future for uh, the PPP and the EIDL loan funding? Right, well, I think right. what's happening, well, there's Mark. Hi, Mark. Hey, I'm back. Welcome back. Go yeah, ahead, thanks. take it away, Mark. My apologies. Uh, I've, I've got a fragile connection. I don't know what's going on. Um, hey, and Joey, just, just to wrap up, I, I, I maybe to, to uh, paint the complete picture of SBA and tie it into sure. what's happening right now, I was going to say that in addition to the typical financing, the uh, technical assistance and government contracting programs that, that we uh, are involved with in support of small businesses. We also actually have a uh, part of our operation that, that provides uh, disaster loan funding. Um, and so that kind of explains a little bit of where we are now uh, with respect to our two programs that have been uh, made available for small businesses impacted by the, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, the economic injury disaster loan is actually a derivative of, of one of our regular disaster programs. And, and as you mentioned already, the Paycheck Protection Program, which was launched and, and stood up very quickly uh, just about probably two and a half weeks ago, um, and I think by all accounts uh, was, was a significant uh, lift on the part of, of the lending community and, and actually ultimately ended up with the deployment of, of a, a lot of money to small businesses, uh, about 340 some odd billion dollars um, were distributed to 1.6 million businesses uh, over, I wanna say it was maybe just a little over a week and a half so uh, where that leaves us right now is, is in a situation where, uh, as, as you indicated, Joey, the, the hope and anticipation based on, on what's out there in the news right now is, is that uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program is going to be um, re-authorized, uh, refunded, replenished, uh, in, in some fashion. Um, I think just today uh, I heard news about the, the Senate uh, either having voted on it or getting ready to vote on a bill that, that might have been somewhere in the range of $500 billion with maybe $300 billion of that uh, being allocated to uh, to small businesses via the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as that Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, the way I understand the process is is that if if in fact that was approved in the Senate, then it would go to the House for a vote, and and for what it's worth, what I've heard is that would be Thursday. Um, and, and presumably the, the legislation would be signed at, at that point. So, so kind of, it, it, it's been a, I, I know a frustrating um, time for businesses in a lot of ways and, and the, uh, the sort of fits and starts that have been uh, associated with our loan programs probably haven't helped things in terms of anxiety and, and people wondering, hey, did I get in in time? Did I get in under the radar or under the uh, the time frame? Am I in the queue? Am I going to be funded? What does this mean? We're out of money now. Uh, am I out for good? 
all these different questions are out there, but, but I think just, you know, as you mentioned, kind of the crystal ball that, that we're uh, looking at is, is primarily, I'm not an insider or anything. We're just regular government employees, but it's based on what I am seeing and, and, and observing in the, in the news primarily. Um, I, I have to think that, that we are going to see some positive movement there uh, shortly in terms of funding and, and the way that I understand it is that it would be funding that not only would reactivate uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, but also provide additional funding for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Both of those unfortunately were, were lapsed uh, in terms of funding. And so the folks that had uh, made the effort to get in the queue, get their applications in uh, for that economic injury disaster loan program, which was the first product that we rolled out. Uh, many of them have been funded, uh, but many, many, many have not. And so they're still in the queue, so to speak. Uh, and, and they're in a situation for the most part where there's nothing else that, that the applicants need to do. Uh, it's really a matter of money and, and working through the, the uh, fairly monumental uh, backlog of applications uh, once that money does become available for the economic injury disaster loan. As far as the Paycheck Protection Program, I think the, uh, the situation is going to be a little bit different uh, in that we're talking about significantly more money. We're talking about many thousands of lenders that are now participating in that program that, that are going to be way more up to speed and equipped uh, to, to get rolling with the program once funding does resume, assuming that happens. And, and so my expectation is a couple of things. Uh, a lot of money is gonna go out really fast. Uh, and at the same time, a lot of lenders that previously didn't quite have a handle on how they were gonna be able to process these or whether they would be able to handle clients that weren't necessarily their existing customers are gonna have a way better idea on that. And I think that there are gonna be way more opportunities for people to get access to this funding from different lending sources, provided that they do it quickly. Um, my personal recommendation right now for, for anybody that has not positioned themselves uh, to be in the funding queue for the Paycheck Protection Program is that, that I would recommend that people reach out, be doing the, the groundwork, uh, trying to identify lenders that are going to be able to provide uh, this, this loan, um, establish a relationship if you don't already have one. I would say this one interesting development that has occurred is we have brought in um, several hundred new lenders uh, into this particular program that weren't previously involved in SBA guaranteed financing. Um, and, and among that group, uh, for those, especially for those people that don't have an established banking relationship, uh, is, is a small handful of some kind of interesting uh, fintech type lenders, like they call it fintech financial technology. They're leveraging, um, you know, uh, information technology to process and, and make loan decisions quickly. Um, and these are folks that I believe would be available for, uh, to connect with businesses anywhere in the country. Uh, I'm talking about, as examples, um, uh, Intuit, uh, Square, um, Linda, help me out. There's a couple more. Um, so for PayPal. Those, do you know if there, is there a, a fee that comes along with, with those to be able to no, utilize that? There's no fee associated with the page. So, so again, Intuit, PayPal, and Square are all doing this. They've all been authorized to participate in the program. You bring up a great question, Joey. So, so the idea here is if this program is available, uh, it really, there's no particular advantage to having a, uh, a relationship with one lender or another, they all are, are governed by the exact same requirements. In other words, they can't, they can't charge a fee. Uh, the interest rate is set. 
and the rules under which they're operating are are the same for everybody. So it's sort of this homogeneous product that that they're pushing out. Lenders do get a, a, a processing fee, but it's paid directly by SBA. So so again, my my uh, personal feeling is that yes, uh, number one, there's going to be new money in the program. Number two, there are a lot of lenders out there that are going to be pushing it out quickly when it does become funded. So number three, uh, folks who think that they're uh, an appropriate candidate for the Paycheck Protection Program should be making those connections right now with lenders. One other thing I wanted to point out is, is in terms of that, that exercise of finding a bank or finding a lender, um, we have what uh, we call it a lender search tool on our website. So if people were to go to sba.gov forward slash coronavirus, they're gonna find a whole bunch of information about both of these programs, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, as well as the Paycheck Protection Program. But within the Paycheck Protection Program section, there's gonna be this lender search tool. And what that's gonna do is give people uh, a chance to put in a, a, a zip code. And uh, by doing so, they're going to then get a list of lenders that are active SBA participants. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that these these are lenders that are net that are going to for sure uh, take their PPP application, but it's a great start because it will identify those lenders in their local community that are that have the agreement in place to do the SBA loans. Um, I, what we're finding is is that the lenders that are doing these loans have got a very uh, available website. Uh, presence. So if you go to any of the lenders out there right now who are doing the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program, you're going to find information on it on their front page. And, and with a few clicks, you're going to be able to go in, you're going to be able to determine if they're taking applications, you're going to be able to determine under what conditions they're taking applications. In other words, there might still be some lenders that aren't able to work with people that aren't their existing customers. But our, our feeling is that there are going to be several lenders that will. So ultimately, I think there's a there's a place, there's a source of funding for folks that want to pursue this. Uh, but but again, my my sense is is that they should be kind of seriously working on making that connection right now, even before we we know for sure if the if and when the funding is going to be there. Um, the other final thought I had was just with respect to to information um, and communication from SBA is is that. Uh, back to that SBA website, sba.gov forward slash coronavirus. Um, people can go there. They're going to see updated information as to the status of the programs. Right now, both the PPP and the EIDL sections indicate that there's been a lapse in appropriations. Uh, if that changes, that, that information will change. Finally, there's an opportunity to get uh, updates from SBA uh, via email. And, and so any of the sort of public facing uh, stuff that we're putting out, folks can get access to that as soon as, as, soon as it's available. And that would be sba.gov forward slash updates. Perfect, so. perfect. That is a lot of really a wealth of information that I'm sure our members are very appreciative to be able to, to, to hear. I'm sure there's a lot of excitement that um, things will get passed in the House and the Senate so we can have some additional funds coming down the pike. Um, so our uh, question and answer boxes have been filling up. So I wanna make sure that we jump into that uh, rapid response portion uh, with our members. Um, so Terea, if we can go ahead and take that first initial question that came through, um, let's present it to our, 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 our guests. You bet, Paul uh, submitted a question. I submitted my application with Bank of America back on April 6th, the first day they accepted applications. I got an email yesterday from B of A basically saying they didn't submit my application in time before the PPP funds ran out. On the news, it sounds like they and other large banks prioritize large loans, leaving many smaller businesses left out. Any advice here? Should I seek out a smaller bank in hopes of getting a slice of the second round of relief Congress is considering? 
That is a great question, Paul. Thank you. I, and and I cannot comment on the uh, veracity of some of those news stories um, in terms of how lenders may or may not have been uh, determining the order of, of processing their paycheck protection loans. Um, what I would say is back to one of my points earlier, I think is, is that there are a lot of lenders that are, are making this program available. Um, and with that in mind, and perhaps with reservations that you might have about that lending institution's ability to process your application, there's nothing that says that you can't go out and make application with another lender. Um, I know certain lending institutions are still limiting the, their ability to process these loans or would still be limiting them uh, to existing clients. But as I mentioned, uh, there are several out there that aren't. Um, when we were initially kind of promoting this program, we were aware of a couple different lenders in addition to those fintech lenders that I mentioned uh, that had been able to process loans um, from non-customers um, and, and their local banks. One of them is Washington Federal and another one is Washington Trust. Um, these obviously are pretty high caliber lending institutions. They've done a tremendous amount of work to get up to speed uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program. I would think that, that it, it might make sense if you were to, uh, to say, okay, I'm gonna get another application in uh, to take a look at, at those as well as perhaps those FinTech lenders and see what their posture is about uh, uh, non-bank customers right now. I'm not suggesting that Bank of America isn't gonna be able to serve you, but again, uh, you can make application to multiple institutions. Obviously, you're only gonna get one loan and you know it might as well be the one that gets it to you quickest. Um, so there's nothing wrong with, with looking out there and seeing if there's another opportunity that looks a little bit better, a little bit more promising than dealing with, with a, one of the really, really large institutions that might have their own di different kinds of challenges as far as getting these loans approved. I have a question uh, from a restaurant owner. Um, are restaurant owners are allowed to, to pay workers to stay home uh, with the PP funds or do they need to physically be working? Right, right, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, and, and this is, this is where we're gonna get into some, some, perhaps some areas where I have to be careful what I, what I say because the rules uh, that were put out there relative to the first iteration of the PPP may not be exactly the same if this program is, is funded uh, additionally. So what I'll say is, is with respect to what I know, and that, that is the first round of, of funding. And so to the question of, hey, I've got a business, I've got employees, uh, but my business e either is, is at very limited capacity or not able to open at all. Um, are you saying uh, that I'm supposed to use the money to pay my employees even though they can't come to work? And the answer is yes. Um, that was and is the intent of the program. It's, it's a really a vehicle for, for uh, employee uh, retention and rehiring. Um, the way that the program was laid out with respect to the initial funding is that it's intended to provide that uh, support to cover payroll for eight weeks from the time of loan disbursement. Um, so even if, and despite the fact that it, it sounds kind of weird and counterintuitive, even if your employees are not able to work, um, you are expected to pay them with these proceeds. Um, the, the ultimate logic is uh, and has been that this is a tool to allow businesses to, to keep their uh, essential operations intact 
so that they're ultimately going to be in a position to re-engage when, when this economic interruption uh, hopefully comes to some kind of a, of a conclusion. I'm going to go back to some initial questions that we had uh, just from our GSBA staff. Um, when do you foresee C6 nonprofit organizations being able to apply for the EIDL or the, the PP loans? Right, right. Thanks, Joey. Um, so I, the, again, this is just based on my reading and, and listening to the news and my kind of awareness of some other uh, issues that, that folks have brought up uh, in terms of any additional uh, legislation. Um, one of those topics certainly has been uh, the idea of broadening the, the net widening the net, if you will, uh, as far as the kinds of entities that would be, uh, have, have the ability to benefit from a paycheck protection program. Um, so the 501c6s uh, and, and as well as hospital organizations and those kinds of other nonprofits are definitely in that dialogue. I don't know exactly what that's gonna, gonna come out looking like, but, but my sense is that, that there, there will be additional eligibility for uh, more types of nonprofits uh, than what, what was included in the initial leg legislation. Additionally, I think that there's going to be uh, an, an, a, a further or a more intensified focus on uh, um, what would typically be considered uh, underserved communities, uh, whether that's um, you know uh, based on geography or based on other other kinds of factors, to make sure that that there are tools and organizations that are going to be able to provide this funding uh, to those businesses that that just may not be in that mainstream and haven't been able to get connected up to this point. So just to follow up about uh, nonprofits, um, what documentation does a nonprofit agency need to provide in order to, to apply for the loans? Do you have an idea? You know, I'm not quite sure, uh, Joey. I, I think uh, ultimately uh, there, there is an application document and it's, it's really quite sparse. Um, but, uh, within that application document, I think the organization is going to indicate the, uh, the type of, uh, entity that they are. Um, and then that there are certifications that the applicant makes as part of that application. And the certifications are kind of intended to, uh, to put the onus on the borrower to, uh, to say, Hey, what you're saying is true. So in other words, if I say I'm a, a, a 501c3 or c6 or what have you in the application, I'm going to certify to that in, the, in that document. I'm going to sign it. And, and what that means is, number one, that the lender does not have to be concerned about getting that documentation, that evidence from you. And number two, that, that hopefully that, that the borrowers are going to be telling the truth. And if, if ultimately they aren't, that, that could be something, you know, down the line that uh, uh, the inspector general or whom, whomever at SBA might, might have reason to look at. But, but again, back to the, the ultimate intent here is to push out money quickly uh, to organizations with, with payroll and with employees. And, and so what we've tried to do is make this program unlike the typical SBA uh, loan product where we expect tremendous uh, due diligence on the part of our lending institutions. In this case, what we're really saying is, hey, uh, you're, gonna, you're going to rely almost exclusively on the certifications of the borrower because we're looking to make this happen quickly. Great, let's bounce back and see if there's any additional uh, Q&A from our followers.
Yes, uh, I have a question here from Lisa. Lisa is asking, how is the money for the EIDL loan being allocated in terms of amount, the advance and the main loan? What is the timing? Uh, she applied on 320, then reapplied on 42, and have heard nothing. Other people who have applied after her have received funding. Uh, and she's having difficulty finding a way to check the status. Right, right. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the EIDL product um, has, hasn't been uh, the smoothest in terms of implementation. Uh, obviously, the, the fact that... So, yeah, I was going to say that the EIDL thing has, has really been... Uh, it, it's just, it's been... Um, so we took the program that we had uh, and and put it out there, but but it was never we never had the systems in place or the funding in place, as it turns out, to really support the demand that that uh, uh, ultimately occurred for that. So we literally have had millions of applications for that particular program, um, and that has has created some real communication challenges, some real system challenges that unfortunately have resulted in people just not being able to get any information about the status of their account, uh, the uh, sort of uh, scheduling of, of when loans are being processed, uh, when they might expect funds, all those different things. Um, I would say that, that with regard to the question, I think I heard that the, the individual had reapplied uh, sometime in the beginning of April. Um, that's a positive sign um, because that means that, that their application is uh, and was submitted under our most current system. And uh, also that, that they would be entitled to um, a certain amount of quick cash advance, which is uh, a forgivable uh, amount of money uh, that ultimately would be di direct deposited into the applicant's account. Um, hopefully, uh, if the program is funded further, this individual will, will receive uh, consideration for having made that application. It's, just, it's a bit of a, of a crystal ball kind of an exercise for us or in that we don't know quite how many applications are out there and, and how much money there is, Joey, to, to, uh, to fund each of those. But what we've been told is that their intent and their approach is to fund or process and fund these applications in the order received. I can't speak, unfortunately, to the uh, to the notion that maybe that somebody was uh, made application later and got their money before. I just I don't quite I don't have enough information about the process our Office of Disaster Assistance uses in in handling these applications. And I again just just on behalf of of our office and our agency, I I really really see. And, and appreciate the frustration that people have had uh, in, in trying to get information on, on this program. Uh, and the only thing I would say again on the positive side is I believe your application is in there. You've done everything you need to do. Uh, and I would ask you to, to try to have patience as SBA tries to work through this really daunting uh, level of, of demand that that program spurned. So. Um, yeah. Well, I want, I want to make sure to say thank you to all of our, our, our viewers right now. Please continue with those Q&A, especially if you're on Facebook Live with us. Uh, we are definitely uh, making sure that we're uh, keeping an eye on your questions and hoping to, to get them answered uh, for the remaining time that we still do have uh, with our, our lovely guests uh, today. Um, Terea, it looks like there was, had been a question from Scott. Yes, Scott asks, I have a stimulus PPP application with different lenders. Is there a okay. risk of dual uh, approvals? If so, how does one not get in trouble? Do I simply request that only one of the loans be funded? Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. And I think uh, 
back to what I was saying before with the gentleman that had applied with Bank of America, um, there's no prohibition against making multiple applications. I mean, you guys are out there trying to do the absolute best you can to, to secure this funding when it's available. Um, and with that in mind, I, I believe that the approach would be um, you're, you're clearly going to take the first uh, approval uh, because of the timing considerations, I'm sure. Uh, and and w once you have done that, I would simply communicate out to any other lender or lenders uh, that that you had made application to, and let them know that that uh, you received funding elsewhere, and you'd like them to cancel the application. Do you anticipate that the EIDL uh, advance will increase above the thousand dollars per employee? You know, I don't know, Joey. Um, I, I simply, yeah, I simply do not know uh, the answer to that. Um, I would say this, we have seen, uh, maybe it just as a related uh, topic, we did just today start to receive some, some information about EIDL loan approvals, um, and they have been happening. Money is, in fact, going out. We also saw information on uh, quick cash advances, and those, in fact, are happening and money is going out. Um, and Washington State, I think, stacks up actually pretty well compared to, to many others in the country in terms of, of actual uh, loan approvals and, and receipt of funds so far. So even though it may not have uh, made a significant uh, impact on the overall uh, level of applications. Um, those are promising um, indicators that, that the program actually is functioning. And, and my hope is that if we can, in fact, get that additional funding, that, that we're going to start to see a lot of those folks that have been waiting, uh, getting some uh, getting some checks go too far back, but you talked a little bit about like allocations of the funds. Um, so there, there is the, the concern about where the money is going to be going uh, for this next batch, because um, sure. there was concern about where the money went uh, from the last batch. Um, you know, a lot of chain restaurants um, seem to, uh, it seemed like larger businesses did receive the funds, where smaller businesses, you know, are still in the queue. Um, you know, what is your thoughts on that or the direction moving forward? Yeah, and and naturally, as as a an SBA employee, uh, I have a, uh, a built-in interest in in the way that that things like this are are communicated and portrayed in the in the news and the media, and I and I have seen uh, some some of that, some of the stories about about maybe some of the larger uh, food chains and and so on. Um, you know, the, I think that there are, uh, different issues and considerations there, but I would, I would say this, uh, based on what I know about, uh, some of the local lenders that have been participating in the program, um, they may have started by saying, Hey, we're, we're really only able to make these available to our existing customers, but I, I'm not aware of them having either the ability to, you know, physically to prioritize uh, applications uh, in that fashion. Um, I, I saw an interesting article about why that maybe, uh, why that perception is out there, that, that there are benefits to a lender uh, if they have an existing customer, maybe it's a larger customer, to uh, giving that customer some kind of priority consideration just as far as the bank's own overall uh, financial health. You know, if they've got a, a customer that they have a bunch of other loans out to, uh, it probably makes some business sense to make sure that, that they get that assistance. But, but again, I'm not a, I, I just, I personally feel like that the, uh, the volume 
of applications, the sheer demand for this program has rendered uh, lenders really, um, really limited their ability to do those kinds of things. I think they're really, ultimately, the vast majority of these are, are being handled on a first come first serve basis and is, is my bottom line thought on that, Joey. Well, thank you for you know, some clarification. We, we definitely appreciate sure. that. Um, Trey, uh, any follow-up additional questions from your end? Yes, yeah, so if you're paying people to stay home, how do you track hours in order to calculate your FTE? Yeah, that's that's another great question, Terea, uh, uh, and and to the questioner, I appreciate that. You know, I think this has been an area of of considerable uh, confusion, and and my hope is that there's going to be some further clarification. Um, what I've been telling people is the the key things are this number one that that the loan amount that you're going to be offered is a function of average payroll uh typically over 2019 although it could be over the last couple of months uh and that loan amount is two and a half times payroll now, while payroll obviously is related to headcount and full time and part time and all of that, to me, it's all about the payroll number, the dollars that are expended for, for payroll and payroll related expenses. And what we're telling people is that based on that average payroll amount times two and a half, that's going to be your loan amount. The responsibility of the business owner. I believe is simply this, that, that they need to be sure that at least 75% of those dollars received are used for payroll or payroll related purposes over the next eight weeks after disbursement of the loan. If they can do that, the loan is gonna be forgiven. So you see, I'm looking at it more in terms of, of dollars, because that's how I read the rules. And that's kind of what I'm advising people. And I think that that's the key. When, when the applicant has an opportunity to get back with the lender, which, which is part of this process, they're gonna be asked to provide evidence uh, that, that that metric was, was actually achieved. In other words, they're gonna be asked to show uh, how did you spend the the money? And if if they can meet that 75% metric as far as uh, payroll or payroll related expenses and any other money that is not used for those purposes is used for either rent or utilities or payment of interest on existing debt. Those are the three areas of other possible expenditures. If they can do all of that, the loan will be forgiven. And I don't believe that there's ultimately going to be any, any need for accounting of, of headcounts, part-time, full-time, this and that. It's going to be about, did you spend 75% or more of the loan for payroll? We do have an, an additional question that's sort of around that same issue, but that the lack of guidelines around the rules of the forgiveness of the loan. Uh, who is it specifically that is deciding the forgiveness? Um, and is there a process to dispute if the forgiveness is, is denied? Now, that is a fantastic question, Joey. Thanks. Um, so what, what we're hoping for is that there is going to be further guidance, and this is even going back to the original 350 billion, that there's going to be further guidance uh, available to our lenders so that they can make that determination. It, they will be responsible for making that determination and it's going to be based on documentation from the customer. Again, we, we're gonna have lenders who are gonna be processing thousands and thousands and thousands of these. So I think that it, what I'm expecting is it's gonna be a pretty limited uh, expectation that we're gonna have 
uh, we're probably going to be looking for the lender to be able to certify that they've seen satisfactory evidence of how the loan was in fact how the loan proceeds were spent and that they've uh, confirmed or otherwise verified that it was uh, at least 75 percent was spent for payroll and then any other funds were spent for those other things once they've done that they're going to have to have the uh, authority to issue that uh, or at least provide SBA with with their confirmation uh, at which time there's going to be some mechanism to forgive the debt. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, but I think that's that they're going to be our lending partners are going to be the ones kind of uh, with the responsibility for making that determination. I have a question from one of our, our Facebook followers. Um, I have a client that has received their PPP funding. Uh, so that eight week period starts now, uh, but they are not allowed to be open. Uh, can the eight week uh, period be delayed? So this is a great question. And, and this is where we get into the rules um, that were put out in support of the first round of the PPP versus what might be coming out uh, to support the upcoming funding that we're expecting. Um, I was actually on a uh, webinar with Congressman Adam Smith yesterday, and that exact same question was asked, and he indicated that he thought that that, that was language that was being uh, built into the, or at least uh, being considered as, as part of the new legislation. In other words, that there would be some flexibility around uh, when the eight weeks of payroll could actually be used. But as far as what we know right now, for people that have received funding through that first PPP, it's, it's a straight eight weeks from the date of first disbursement, even if uh, the, the, the business is not operational. So in a lot of ways, this is, a, again, kind of about pushing money out uh, in, in a high volume, uh, rapid fashion, and, and to some extent, sort of as a substitution for unemployment, but with the ultimate upside being that hopefully it's going to allow um, organizations to keep their workforce intact. There was an additional follow-up uh, question uh, from this individual. Um, another client has their PPP funding, um, but is very concerned about the forgiveness. Um, Mark, sure. could you speak speak on the details to, of supporting the seventy-five percent of the payroll yeah. cost required? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, this is not unlike some of the calls that we're now receiving. Um, people have uh, have they got their money? Uh, but there's not obviously a, a close working relationship with with the bank as to what to do next because the banks are are handling thousands and thousands of these in some cases. Um, so again, the onus is on on the borrower uh, to kind of meet some of those basic uh, guidelines that we discussed earlier. Now, to me, um, I'm keeping in mind that that. Number one, that the intent of this thing and the loan uh, approval itself is based on payroll. So any kind of documentation that I have and can retain that is gonna illustrate the fact, whether it's canceled checks, whether it's other kinds of, of, uh, of tax forms um, that, that demonstrate that, that clients were, were paid and that money was expended for that purpose, uh, that's what I'm looking to uh, compile, aggregate, keep, uh, develop over that eight week period so that I can present that back to the lending institution. Probably gonna do that electronically too because that's how everything is happening right now. Um, but I don't think that there's a, there's a prescribed methodology. I would imagine that if somebody had a larger payroll, uh, they're going to be using some tools like, you know, even even things like just, uh, you know, spreadsheets uh, indicating uh, dates that that uh, 
that folks were paid, who the folks that were recipients of, of the funding, all those different things, uh, what additional payroll costs might have been covered with, with the, the loan funds. Um, that's, if it, if it were me and I was a lender, that's what I would be looking for. Um, SBA has not put out anything really detailing um, at, at a granular level what, what lenders need to have. So I think it's going to be a best effort kind of an approach, both on the part of the borrower and the part of the lender, just understanding that this whole thing is, is, is such high volume uh, and such, such an urgency around it that uh, everything's not gonna be perfect. There's no way. Uh, so I'm kind of suggesting that in the absence of really, really, really clear policy guidance, either for lenders or borrowers, uh, you keep those fundamental concepts in mind of, hey, this is about payroll. We want you to cover at least uh, or use at least three quarters of the funds for that purpose. Do the best you can to document that you did that. And, and my hope is that that's gonna be sufficient both for the borrower to achieve forgiveness and for the lender to be able to kind of validate that, that they did what they were supposed to do. We're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I think we could have time for at least uh, one more question. Terea, uh, did you have an additional question for us? Yes, uh, Jessica writes, I run a seasonal business where my payroll is significantly higher at other times of the year. My average payroll annually is more than my average payroll during the off season. How can this be accounted for if we are to pay 75% related to payroll? Yeah, um, thanks, Treya. Um, this is a tough one, Joey, and, and I, it came up on another call and I wasn't able to get a very good answer. Um, I don't know if the individual has received uh, PPP funding yet or not. If they haven't, I'm hopeful that, that there's going to be some additional guidance for seasonal businesses uh, built into the, mm -hmm. to the new legislation or that the ability to spread the eight weeks out uh, might be a way to manage the seasonality of the business. So that's sort of a stay tuned um, kind of an answer, if you will. Perfect. All right. Well, it looks like we lost Linda at some point <laughs> during the conversation. <laughs> um, I definitely wanted to, to have her jump on and, and, and give some additional words of, of wisdom by chance. But um, uh, let's have you do that, Mark. Could you just give you know our viewers yeah. some, some last thoughts um, to, to, to take along, you know, especially with yeah. Hopefully, the excitement that's about to happen. Uh, yeah. First of all, I, I appreciate you guys uh, what you're doing uh, as an organization and and supporting your businesses. And you guys have all got a lot of courage doing what you do. Um, and and I appreciate the chance to get on and and talk about what we're trying to do uh, in response to this. Um, I guess uh, you know my my personal hope is that uh, that things are going to, to get better uh, in relatively short order, but, but more than likely what that looks like is gonna be different for different people and, and different organizations. Um, we're gonna continue to be out there and available to support folks, um, whether it's through the financing side of things, whether it's through these special programs or, or whether it's through some of the advising and, and counseling that ultimately is going to be probably equally important in, in ensuring longevity of businesses. Um, I want to just ask that people continue to, to kind of stay in touch with us. Uh, again, sba.gov is a great resource. Our local office is sba.gov forward slash WA. Uh, and some of our, our resource partners are just really, really outstanding. I would kind of highlight uh, SCORE and the Small Business Development Center, uh, the Women's Business Center, as well as the Veteran Business Outreach Center. They're all engaged 
they're all now engaged in 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 trying to help find solutions for the same things that you guys are dealing with. Um, you're not out there all alone. These are services that are available at no cost. Um, and so while we right now are dealing with the, uh, the sort of uh, short term funding issues of, hey, what's gonna happen with our program here? And when, we, when are we gonna get more money? And am I gonna get that money, et cetera, et cetera. The longer term stuff uh, about maybe engaging with some of these resource partners can, I think, really be fruitful uh, for businesses. And I, and I would just encourage people to keep that in mind. Hang in there, obviously. Uh, if you guys have specific questions of me, I'm happy to answer them. Let me give you my email address. It's mark.costello at sba.gov. Questions about a pending application, questions about who to uh, pursue in terms of an upcoming PPP loan, if that's the case, uh, or, or follow up on any of these other resources. I, I'd be pleased to have a chance to, to advise uh, your membership on any of that, Joey. And uh, again, hang in there and, and best of luck to everybody. Well, not to put you completely on the spot, but we would love to be able to welcome you back. I'm sure, uh, as you could tell, there were a lot of questions from our members, um, and I know that there will be more um, in the weeks ahead. Um, so Absolutely. we'd love to be able to, to take the time to, to welcome you back uh, to join Absolutely, us. Um, so on behalf of GSBA, uh, we would like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in today. Special thank, uh, thanks to Mark and Linda, of course, from the SBA for sharing their strategies uh, during COVID-19. GSBA members, if you have any follow-up questions, um, or if you may have, we have made missed one of your questions within the Q&A, um, please do reach out to the GSBA membership team. Uh, we are here to help um, answer those questions for you. Um, you can also visit the GSBA online guide and directory, uh, find uh, listings of members ready to uh, connect with you. Um, the directory is, uh, you know, it features hundreds of businesses um, there that, that support equality for all. Uh, when you log off of today's rapid response, um, do be sure to take a moment to fill out the GSBA survey presented. Um, this will help us with future GSBA rapid response programming. Um, also, uh, don't forget to continue to visit the GSBA COVID-19 emergency resource page uh, for up-to-date information located on our website. Uh, for our next uh, GSBA rapid response, um, that will take place next Tuesday April the 28th at 10 a.m. Um, our special guest will be Lindsay T.H. Jackson. Uh, join us as we explore the mental, physical, and emotional impacts of COVID-19 on business leaders and employees as we all attempt to navigate this unique experience together. So until next time, stay home and stay healthy. Thank you.